Welcome to the History of European Theatre podcast, and thanks for joining me on this journey through millennia of theatrical history. Episode 71, French Renaissance Theatre, Part 2. Aristotle Rules, OK? Last time, I described how French dramatists negotiated their way through the early Renaissance under the influence of Italian comedy and a royal family who generally wanted distraction in their theatrical entertainment rather than education or anything that questioned the status quo. In troubled times for the country, thanks to religious conflicts, Catherine de Medici brought the Italian influence to the court and the country. The fact that there was only a single public playhouse permitted in Paris until about 1600 meant that a firm control of authorised theatrical performances in the capital was well maintained. But outside of the city, things were a little freer. By the mid-16th century, there were established troops of travelling players based in several French cities. Rouen, Amiens and Dijon all had their resident troops soon after the middle of the century, and other cities probably did too, but we have less well-recorded evidence for this. The ban on religious drama that was placed on actors in the middle of the century was countrywide, so the troops also relied heavily on comedy and pastoral pieces to fill the gap left by the prohibition on the old cycle plays. Tragic plays never featured very much. These troops operated on a commercial basis, and safe to assume that for many it was a hand-to-mouth existence. So as comedy always proved more popular than tragedy, it not unreasonably made up the majority of their repertoire. The troops travelled quite widely, and in the early 17th century found access to the Parisian theatre market was open to them at last. After the opening of the second Parisian theatre, the Theatre de Marias, and the continued suppression of religious plays, the Confraternity of the Passion gave up on producing their own repertoire, and simply took an income from renting the Hotel de Bourgogne to travelling troops. Visiting troops soon took the place of the jugglers and acrobats that had previously rented the theatre. And for the first time, Paris was a city where there was simultaneous multiple choice of theatre for the public to enjoy. As more troops included Paris in their touring circuit, there was demand for more theatre space. And one day, an unknown troop leader persuaded the owner of a tennis court to let him show his plays in his court, and a trend was started. Tennis was very popular in Paris, so there were several courts in different parts of the city. They were covered buildings with viewing galleries around the outer sides of the playing court and were almost the same size as the theatre space in the Theatre de Bourgogne. All a company had to do was put a platform stage at one end of the court, remove the net and maybe add some floor-level seating and voila, a theatre space. Admittedly, this was nowhere near as ambitious as the Italian and English purpose-built playhouses of roughly the same period – But it was popular with the French, and soon tennis courts were frequently being converted temporarily into theatres to give the travelling players more space. Apart from Robert Garnier, the French theatre was lacking a writer of real note. But in the last quarter of the 16th century, Antoine de Montcrestien came to the fore, and as Garnier's powers waned, French theatre had a new kid on the block. Born into a Huguenot family about 1575, he was orphaned at a young age and taken in by a family in the minor aristocracy. They gave him a good education and aimed him at military service. But the young Antoine appreciated books and poetry more than military tactics, and as soon as he was of age and came into his legacy that his parents had left him, he set himself up in Paris as an independent man of letters. He looked to that now familiar source for his plays, Greek mythology and the Bible but his preference, somewhat against the trend of the time, was for tragedy. His imitation of ancient Greek theatre was perhaps better than anybody else's at the time. He used a five-act model and verse that was meticulously revised until he was satisfied that it was compliant with the verse form and easy to understand. In particular, he liked to use the well-known ancient Greek traits of the educational aphorism and lines of verse alternating between one character and another. His plays used a chorus, and all violent or shocking action took place off stage and was reported to the protagonists by a messenger rushing onto the stage, all of which, I'm sure, sounds very familiar from season one of the podcast. His first tragedy, published in 1595, was La Cata Ginoise, the mythical story of a noblewoman during the Second Punic Wars. In the next couple of years, he wrote and published five more plays, including La Corsaise, about Mary, Queen of Scots, and David, about the Jewish biblical king. 
All had professional performances, and on their success he increased his wealth, married well, and became favoured by Prince Henry Bourbon, from a minor branch of the ruling family. In the early years of the 17th century he became much more politically aware and gained some serious enemies. He was involved in several duels, which were illegal in France at the time, and was seriously wounded in 1603. Two years later he had to flee to England when he killed his opponent in another duel. Le Corsais then became a particularly important play for him. He made good use of the Greek tradition of the lament in this play, which appealed to the French audience, who were well aware of Mary's long and eventually fruitless wait for marriage in the French court and her tragic death. It also appealed to James I in England, who may have been instrumental in organising his return to France after a relatively short period of exile. When he returned to France, he moved out of the capital and set up a foundry producing steel deep in the countryside and also produced works on economic theory. In 1620, he joined a Huguenot rebellion using his influence and money to raise troops. But in October 1621, while travelling around Normandy on this task, he was discovered resting in a tavern and was killed. He was tried posthumously and found guilty of treason. His body was strapped to a wheel and burned. Much as his plays were admired for their poetry and skilful use of Greek ideals, they are static and in many cases include inconsistencies in the plot. In Le Corsais, for example, Elizabeth initially pardons Mary, but then changes her mind without any explanation. In another case, much of the opening act of his last play, Hector, argues for non-violent solutions to conflict. But Hector takes no account of this when he rushes off to fight his enemy, threatening to cut them all to pieces. Notwithstanding the inconsistencies, the strength of his plays is in the debate of the ideas that they contain, something that was to become a strong feature of French theatre later in the century, when the likes of Racine emerge. Comic plays also included farces, perhaps the most popular form of theatre of the day in Paris. Records from the Theatre de Bourgogne make particular mention of a troupe who had three expert comedians who were adept at keeping the Parisian audiences entertained. Henri Lagrande, Robert Garin and Hugh Garou had met when they worked in a bakery. Their playful interactions and joking around as they worked became so appreciated by customers that they decided to pursue a life as part of a travelling troupe. Once they'd made it to Paris, they performed at the tennis court venues until their reputation allowed them access to the larger Hotel de Bourgogne. There they used three standard stock characters, a cunning valet, a bumbling old man and an insistent pedant, in different plots and situations. Between the three players, it was said that an audience never stopped laughing from one end of a play to the other as they mixed physical comedy with verbal jokes and impressions of different types of French citizens that the Parisians could have a good laugh at. They were also persuaded to take on serious roles and, perhaps wisely, build themselves under different names to make a firm distinction between the two types of performance. There's no doubt that they were influenced by the Italian Commedia dell'arte, who had been performing in Paris by special permission of King Henry IV. And we will of course come back to that influential form of comedy, but for the moment we just need to be aware that they were performing in France on irregular occasions. If the Théâtre de Bourgogne was where you went for your fix of farce, then on the days you preferred something more serious, it was always worth a look at the Théâtre de Marias. Without the attraction of the three farceurs at the Bourgogne, its rival put on tragedy, pastoral works and more refined comedy. That theatrical landscape changed when Valoran Leconte arrived in town. He was an established actor who had been leading a well-regarded troupe in the last years of the 16th century and had visited Paris on several occasions at that time. Things changed in 1599 when he merged his troupe with the resident troupe which included those three popular farceurs at the Hotel de Bourgogne and took up residency there that was to last for 80 years. Now there was a settled resident company in Paris and the combined troupe was renamed the Comédiens de Roi, the King's Players. But this is not the same patronage arrangement that the English theatre at the time is so well known for. The troupe only needed the permission of the city and the confraternity of the passion in their role as landlords to perform, not the King. So it's thought that the name came about because the troupe did perform at court and Leconte knew a good marketing opportunity when he saw it. 
He took to using the name, and when the palace didn't raise any objection, well, it just stuck. In what looks like a strange decision, Leconte chose to start his regime with verse drama by Jodel and some biblical tragedies. It was a bad choice, missing the popular mood, and he was forced to send some of the troupe out on tour to supplement the income from the new Paris base. For several years, he had to repeat that strategy, with the tours not only going through France, but the Low Countries too. His luck changed when he formed an alliance with a new playwright, Alexander Hardy. Hardy's early life is, to say the least, elusive. Born in Paris somewhere between 1560 and 1572, we know nothing of his life before he turned up at the Hotel de Bourgogne. The general consensus derived from the quality of his plays and his familiarity with Greek and Roman and contemporary material, is that he must have had a good university-level education and probably acted as part of a touring troupe. Scholars also detect a Spanish influence in his work, so the suggestion is that he spent some of those missing years in the company of playwrights in Madrid. His earliest plays date from 1622 and were produced at both of the Parisian theatres. But after touring with Leconte and his troupe, he became formally attached to the Bourgogne as their writer-in-residence. He was prolific, claiming to have written at least 600 plays, and I've seen that number quoted as high as 800. Either way, it's probably a hyperbolic boast, but whatever the actual number, we can agree that prolific is fair. However, only 34 of his plays survive. That profligacy probably came out of necessity. He was no aristocrat, and he had no patron or sponsor. He produced no court poetry for which he might have expected a reward. As far as we can tell, he earned his living from his playwriting, pleasing the paying public and possibly from acting. Many of Henri's plays are adaptations and translations of Italian and Spanish works, which give the impression of being thrown out with little care, perhaps helping to explain his incredible work rate. He is, in fact, France's first playwright that we can identify as fully professional with some confidence. The surviving plays show that he had an eye and an ear for fast-paced active theatre, in a way that was pretty unusual for his time. His plays display little of the staged poetry and none of the bombastic prose so common at the time. He dispenses with a chorus and uses a broad medieval platform stage that was still in use at the time to produce theatrical effect not seen since the height of the cycle plays. He places several locations on the stage and moves the action quickly between them in fast-paced scenes. On occasions, he even has two scenes playing simultaneously. He encouraged actors to drop the standardised mannerisms and gestures that accompanied every word or emotion in the style of the time, and to speak more naturally on the stage. Typically, soliloquies in his plays are shorter than was common, and dialogue is cut down to something much more sparse than audiences were used to. Following a Spanish trend, he abandoned Aristotle and set plays in multiple locations and across longer periods of time than the Aristotelian 24 hours. The contemporary audience could have been very challenged by these changes. This was a significantly different theatre from what they had been used to for decades, but Henri had not done yet. His plays were popular and he became even more daring. He mixed comedy and tragedy, made his plots more and more complicated, with an eye on maintaining suspense and building to points of theatrical surprise. One of those surprises was that he abandoned the reporting of violent acts and showed the violence on stage. And most surprising of all was that he wrote into his scripts that lovers should embrace and kiss, something that had been considered far too shocking to be seen on the Parisian stage before. But his innovation and daring paid off. In terms of popularity, he had no equal. The Hotel de Bourgogne prospered when they presented his plays. Advertising started to carry his name as a playwright, not something that was often done at the time, and there was undoubtedly pressure on him to produce the next hit as quickly as possible. There's no evidence he was ever rich, so maybe his deal with Leconte was not that good, but he continued to churn out scripts to order. He was a jackdaw, taking ideas or plots from one play and merging them into scenes borrowed from another or made up himself without too much concern for plausibility. You get the impression that he didn't regard his work as literary or written to be long-lasting. He's quoted as having said, Heaven be blessed, I can subordinate all loftier ambitions to the demands of my trade. Of the surviving scripts, Mariamne is thought to be his best. 
Written between 1505 and 1515, it's a biblical tragedy, but functions as a pretty good psychological study of love and jealousy. Mariamne is the wife of King Herod, but she recognises his failings as a usurper and instigator of the murder of her brother and grandfather. Herod remains in love with her despite this strain on their relationship, but his siblings resent her power over him and concoct an accusation of treason against her. When faced with the charge of trying to poison her husband, Mariamne becomes depressed and suicidal, and doesn't offer any defence, nor does she deny that she has taken lovers when that also baseless accusation is thrown at her. Herod is consumed with jealousy and orders her execution the following day. During the night he comes to her cell and pleads with her to confess so that he can forgive her and save her life, but she refuses and at dawn is taken off to her death. Distraught, all that Herod can do is plan to raise a lavish memorial to her. Despite at least a handful of notable works, his prolific and in many cases rather slapdash output was disliked by others who saw it as reducing the value of French theatre, with its concern for popularity overriding the desire for good art. Henri's innovations and his abandonment of Aristotelian principles became tarred with the same brush, and laid the foundations for the later reaction against all that his theatre stood for in the neoclassical period. By the time he died in Paris in 1632, during the latest visitation of the plague, he was part of that debate, despised by some, but still loved by his audiences. But the conclusion on the career of Alexandre Henri should not end on a down note. His contribution to French Renaissance theatre was long overlooked thanks to the scholarly focus on the literary and courtly works. But if we're looking at the history of theatre as a whole, then we have to acknowledge that Henri's works were not only hugely popular, but groundbreaking too. For all the faults in his plays, his ability to work across genres has been recognised. Of the surviving works, 12 are tragedies, 10 are tragic comedies, 4 are variously recognised as somewhere between the two, 5 are pastorals, and there are 3 dramatic poems. Now assuming that this is representative of his complete canon, then he displayed an ability to move across genres that was rarely surpassed even in this age of the polymath. But there is one further way in which he really stands out. Unlike his contemporaries, he was a man of the stage and a man of dramatic action. Few of his plays have survived because they were written to be performed and neither he nor the actors who guarded their parts carefully, always fearful of the potential for piracy, had an interest in printed editions. Most of the playwrights discussed as part of the French Renaissance theatre were writing for the court, as a scholastic exercise or for the literary salon and very few are known to have had professional productions, the notable exceptions being Robert Garnier, Antoine de Montcrestien and Henri who had by far the most known professional productions. Leconte and Henri fell out at some point, and he went to write for the Marias, always happy to earn a crust where he could. Leconte in turn gave up the Bourgogne in 1617 for reasons that are unclear. He'd managed the company for a long time, so perhaps he'd just had enough of the day-to-day -day running of a busy theatre. His regular troupe numbered between 12 and 18 actors, with outsiders being brought in for particular productions with large casts or when a need for extras was required. The actors were all employed on contracts covering two or three years at most, but the company was almost always in a state of flux as players left early for one reason or another. The departure of leading actors, and particularly when those three farceurs retired and died, led to times of change as Leconte found new talent for the theatre out of necessity. For all its success, the theatrical life day by day was, for most actors, a hand-to-mouth existence. As manager, Leconte was in the best position financially. He owned two shares in the enterprise, with senior actors owning one share and junior actors owning some smaller part of a share. The daily takings were divided between the sharers at the end of each day so all were taking a share of the risk. With the turnover of members of the company, it must have been a complicated and stressful business keeping everything running and the division of funds fair. By 1607, women are recorded as taking roles on stage, which seems to have been quickly accepted by the Parisian audiences. Being an actor was, like in England, not an easy life. 
French actors were not treated as vagabonds like the English, but the trade was still seen as close to prostitution, and for most actors, their social standing was very low. Despite the share and ownership system, few seemed to have become rich on their trade, however admired they were for their skills. Individual actors usually took stage names to preserve some anonymity, often for the sake of the good name of their family, but as regular performers they became known and recognised by their stage names. The actor's relationship to the audience was close because apart from acting in the play of the day, one or two of them were put out early on the stage to entertain the gathering crowds. The public tended to gather early at the theatres in Paris to get the best spot for the play, and jostling and fights breaking out amongst the crowd, particularly in the heat of summer, were not uncommon. As soldiers in the crowd carried swords, and a concealed dagger was commonly part of a young man's attire, this could quickly turn nasty. So the actors were there to entertain, distract the crowd, and diffuse any growing tensions they spotted before the play started. Henri's success at the Hôtel de Bourgogne led to others trying their hand there too. Theophile Vaux made an impression there in 1617 with his Pyramide et Thisbe, but his career went no further. His liking for writing libertine poetry got him into trouble, and seemingly unable to stop himself, he continued to cause the authorities concern with his writing until he was judged to have insulted the king in a pamphlet and was sentenced to be burned alive. He fled before the sentence could be carried out, so a bundle of rags to represent him was ceremoniously burned in his absence. When he was finally caught, he managed to convince his accusers that he had changed his ways and was released to serve a year in exile. His conversion to a reformed life does seem to have been genuine, but unfortunately for us that included staying well away from theatrical activity. Like Vaux, Jean Marais, born in 1604, was a champion of the Aristotelian stage. He was something of a prodigy, penning his first play while he was still at boarding school. This tragic comedy and the following pastoral play he produced were so well received that despite his low social status and youth, he became the darling of Parisian society for a while. Throughout a long literary career, whenever he turned to the stage, he adhered closely to Aristotle's unities. But this is not to say that for the intellectuals the debate was settled yet. Indeed, these were just the first shots in a long battle. After Henri died, his cause was taken up by playwrights who saw the Aristotelian rules as a constriction against the creativity of a playwright. It was a lively debate, both in the salons and on the stage, with some playwrights swinging between the two arguments. One of these was Pierre de Royer, who began his playwriting career in 1629 to supplement his civil servant's income. He aimed at the popularist, producing tragic comedies following in Henri's footsteps. But by 1644, he had seen Murray rise in popularity and wrote a series of thoroughly Aristotelian tragedies. To his credit, he succeeded in popularising tragedy, with some of his plays remaining in the standard repertoire of French theatre for more than a century. The two camps continued to fight it out on the Parisian stage through the first half of the 17th century. The last notable contributions coming from Jean de Retoux, who produced several plays that were the last high point for the freethinkers and the innovators. He took up the position of the main writer for the troupe at the Bourgogne in 1632, by which time he'd already penned several plays, even though he was only about 18 years old. His plays were romantic comedies, and like Henri, he was much influenced by Spanish and, to a lesser extent, English theatre, putting them firmly against those who still looked to the classical models for their inspiration and rules. By 1634, he had already authored 30 plays, which included adaptations, and had found favour from those who enjoyed his plays and also his poetry. Although he stood against the Aristotelian constraints, he was not afraid to adapt Greek classics, producing versions of Plautus's Antiphon, Antigone and others. He was friendly with Pierre Cornell, and may have defended him in his dispute with the Académie Française over his tragedy Le Cid. Although Retou and Cornell were contemporaries, Cornell was just three years older, Retou's theatre sits much more comfortably in the closing years of the Renaissance period than in the neoclassical period, where Cornell sits much more happily alongside Moliere and Racine. We will, of course, return to all of those later. As for Retou, he continued to write plays, and in 1646 produced the first of four of his best plays. The veritable Saint Genest is the story of an early Roman martyr to Christianity. 
What makes the play special is his use of a play within a play to expound on the idea of theatrum mundi, the metaphor that all the world's a stage and we are actors on it. The Roman actor, Ganest, is playing a Christian martyr when he converts to Christianity, all very theatrical and meta. In this and in his later plays, he improved on the uneven prose of his earlier plays and produced simplified plots. He had hit a stride that for many puts him as an equal to Cornell, but Cornell has the advantage of a longer life in which to develop his work and make his mark. In 1650, the plague returned to France. By then, Rattou had returned to his hometown, married and become a local magistrate. Despite the plague, he remained at his post, but was taken off by it, thereby becoming the end marker of the Renaissance, rather than, possibly, the fourth great playwright of the neoclassical period. Despite Rattou's slightly later writings, for most, 1625 marks the end of the French Renaissance period. By then, the ascendance of the neoclassical had become unstoppable, and the French Renaissance had moved on. Because the next period of French theatre is such a strong one, the playwrights of the French Renaissance are sometimes now regarded as little more than marking time as a well-developed medieval theatre became neoclassical. I hope I've shown in the last two episodes that there is at least a little more to it than that. Before the Aristotelian rules and the grip of the Académie Française took hold, French dramatists took up the debate about what theatre should be and do with earnest and serious intent. Unfortunately, there was a lack of public space for the debate in the Parisian theatre, and the public preference for light comedy acted further as a break on serious development of theatre. There are not too many facts and figures available about the theatre audience in the Parisian theatres in the Renaissance, but from what I've seen, I don't think that the citizens had quite the same thirst for innovative theatre that the English had. Perhaps this is just a French sensibility, but the craving to find rules to accept and adhere to, however genuinely meant, became a constraint on the French theatre. Once firm dividing lines had been drawn between these two types of theatre, that which followed Aristotle and that which did not, creativity suffered. But at least what we do start to get is some details about not only the playwrights, but the performers and the theatre managers. Working through the earlier periods of theatre history, I've longed for more detail about the people who actually produced theatre, and finally, we're just about there. The Parisian theatres of the Bourgogne and the Marias are so important to the story of French theatre, and I've been pleased to find and present as much information about them as I could. Courtly theatre remains important for a while to come yet, but for now, we're getting the start of an understanding of a theatre for the people, presented by individuals that we can get to know at least a little. But the period really does belong to the playwrights in France. Jodel, Garnier, Hardy and Rattou are the standouts who are flanked by a large number of minor playwrights who came in their wake and put a French twist on Italian theatre. And yes, they are the foundations on which the neoclassical period was built, but something in their own right too. Next time, I'll continue with more continental Renaissance theatre. This time, we're off to Spain. It's the start of a period that would become known as the Spanish Golden Age, so we can look forward to some interesting theatre history there. Join me next time to find out more. In the meantime, if you've not already done so, please join the Facebook group or page to keep up to date with what's happening on the podcast. On the Patreon feed, we're getting towards the end of the Henslow's Diary series, so if you'd like to jump ahead a bit and hear some wonderful detail about Elizabethan theatre in London, please do take a look at that and join up there for a small monthly fee. There's a link in the show notes. Thanks everyone for your continued support. The podcast just went through a bit of a milestone recently as we passed through 50,000 all-time downloads. For me, here on my own, and being quite aware that this is something of a niche subject, well, that really is quite an inspiring number. Thanks for listening, and thanks for continuing to listen. So, I really do look forward to your company next time, but if you have any comments or concerns in the meantime, you can contact me by email at thoetp at gmail.com or via Twitter at thoetp. Thank you.